Acts uh, 16, verse 9. Let me, I'm going to start with verse 6. They went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia and had been forbidden by the Spirit to speak the word in Asia. When they come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. And passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, and during the night, Paul had a vision in which a Macedonian man was standing and pleading with him, cross over to Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, we immediately made efforts to set out from Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. Now, this is a Memorial Day weekend, and I, I want to talk about that in the light of this passage, which is, may seem like a kind of a stretch. But I, I, I need to tell you, my wife and I both uh, come from families that uh, where every generation people have served in the military. Um, we, both of us, uh, grew up in the Appalachian region. She was from central Kentucky and I was from southern West Virginia. And uh, uh, the reason that our families were there is because our ancestors were given land grants for fighting in the Revolutionary War. And... Uh, and, and they, uh, they started life there in what was at that time in the extreme uh, West. Uh, interesting thing about that is my wife's family were Methodist, uh, and she's a descendant of the Wesleys, in fact. And, and so one of the, the, the uh, grandson of Samuel Wesley went to Virginia as a missionary, and then his grandson uh, went to Kentucky because Bishop Asbury, which was the head of the Methodist Church, had decided to put the headquarters of the Methodist Church in the far distant west uh, of, uh, uh, of Wilmore, Kentucky. And he said within a hundred years, the, the country was surely to grow this far. And he wanted to get there first. Uh, well, it, it passed him up along the way, but anyway. And so her her family moved and established a Methodist church there in, the, in central Kentucky. But um, uh, every generation that we've had people in the military beginning with the Revolutionary War. My uncles all served in the Second World War. Uh, my wife uh, has uncles also served in, in the Second World War. Uh, and uh, she, she has an uncle that died in the Normandy invasion. And so... You know, this, this is a, a part of our heritage and our families. And yet there is something about right from the beginning of our faith, there's been this kind of paradox that how can we, being a people of peace, that uh, we read our scriptures and particularly at the end of the Old Testament, the prophets are saying they're going to beat their, war, their swords into plowshares and not learn of war anymore. Uh, you know that he said the nation will not rise up against nation he praises the God that breaks the bow and causes war to cease to the ends of the earth uh, this, this is a real paradox because uh, uh, you, you read also the teachings of Jesus and Jesus is very nearly a pacifist uh, he says if somebody strikes you one, one cheek turn the other cheek uh, it doesn't stop us and never has stopped us from actually cold cocking the guy that slaps us on the cheek. But we know, that we know that Jesus told us not to do it. And as we grow in faith, we take that more seriously and we wrestle with it. And this, is, this has been a problem since the very beginning, or a paradox, we might say. Uh, our, our military chaplains certainly deal with it. We have one of our own uh, sons in the gospel here from Christ Church that's serving in, as a military chaplain, and that's Jay Clark. His mom and dad are with us today. Uh, Jay, you know, he has to deal with this. On, he is a lieutenant in the US, U.S. Army and also has to deal with the fact that he's, you know, he's a Christian minister of the gospel who is, uh, is calling for a time when there will be no need for military and no need uh, for people to uh, bear arms against, against other uh, people. So this is something we, we, have, we have always had in common. And it might have been better in some ways for someone else to preach this, like Pastor Greg. Pastor Greg has been in the military, and he also was an aide to the chaplain, and he dealt with that side of it as well. And he 
probably could have fleshed this out better than I can because I did not serve in the military. But, you know, it's, it's impossible if you know Pastor Greg to, to not know he is a man of peace and a godly man, one of the best men I've ever met, one of the best pastors I've ever met, and this church is so fortunate to have him and his servants. And he might express himself differently than I'm expressing myself, but I think he gets what I'm trying to say uh, because we do deal with this about promoting a kingdom of peace and where you know no one hurts or destroys on all my holy mountain and so forth. And we pray for that day. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So I'm going to tell you the story uh, of something to, to kind of set the stage today that I read in the Reader's Digest many, many years ago. But first, before I tell you that, I, I want to tell you this morning and yesterday, I was actually reading the story of the Apostle Peter going to the house of Cornelius. And the very first Gentile convert to the gospel was a, uh, an officer in the Roman army which is fascinating because the Jews didn't like the Romans and they particularly didn't like Roman soldiers. And uh, Peter had to have a, a vision from God to say, I want you to go talk to this soldier, this military officer, and I want you to go to the military garrison and, uh, and meet him there. And he's like, you gotta be kidding me. And the Lord said, would you rather eat a turtle? I mean, uh, you, can, you can read that. That's kind of what he said. Or a snail. Uh, and he's like, I'm not French, can't eat snails. Uh, but but the, the fascinating thing is as Peter is proclaiming the gospel to Cornelius and all the people gathered there, presumably other soldiers, the Holy Spirit fell on them and Peter says, as it did to us in the beginning. And he turns to uh, his friends, his Jewish friends and says, I don't think I can forbid baptism because the Holy Spirit has been poured out on them just like it was on us in the beginning. And there is no hint that Peter says, well, since this has happened and you told me that you're going to follow whatever I said that you're supposed to do, you got to get out of the army now and you can't be in the military. So he doesn't do that. When the military officer comes to Jesus and says, I've got a servant or, uh, that is in need of healing, the Lord says, well, you know, gosh, I mean, I can't, I can't do it. So we've, we've had this complicated uh, uh, kind of paradox before us uh, in terms of how, how do we serve in the military? How do we live out a life of peace? How do we look for that day when no one uh, carries a sword or drags a chain? How are we for, uh, aiming toward the vision of the prophets to where wars are ceasing from the ends of the earth? And, and we're supposed to live in the light of that now and to be people of peace ourselves now. How do we do that? And I, one of the greatest stories I've ever heard was this story in the Reader's Digest, and it goes like this. It was an American prisoner of the Japanese in the Second World War. And, uh, and so he was kept, you know, the, the uh, um, Allied soldiers that were uh, captured by the Japanese had it particularly difficult in, uh, in the Pacific arena. Uh, and so uh, uh, this soldier tells a story of he was in this little kind of confinement. They tried to keep the soldiers separated in this camp. He, was, he wasn't even seeing uh, other American or uh, European soldiers. And one day he said uh, uh, that this Japanese soldier came to him and started yelling at him and poking at him with his bayonet and opened up the, this little cage that he was in, in the jungle, uh, in one of the islands, and pointed for him to go into the jungle. And he said all the other Japanese soldiers were laughing, and so he could only imagine something terrible was going to happen to him. Uh, you know, either he was going to be shot, he would be sexually abused, something was about to happen, because he was just reading that situation in this way. So the soldier's yelling at him and pushing him with the bayonet, and he's walking and, and being prodded. And, and so he's a believer, and he started comforting himself, and he started singing. And he started singing, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. And he gets, he gets more and more courage, and he keeps singing it. And all of a sudden, he, he stops and he hears behind him 
Someone is singing it too, but in Japanese. And he looks and the soldier does this and keeps singing and they sing. And they go to a place far from the others and he says, I'm going to bring you out here from time to time. And he said, we'll pray together. But you must never let on. And sometimes I will have to abuse you in the camp. I will yell at you. I will hurt you. But he said, I'm your brother in Christ. And he had bread and he broke bread to him. And they sing together. And they're in the broken English and the limited knowledge of Japanese, singing songs to one another, recalling the Lord's Prayer. And then going back into the camp and he said, uh, they, this soldier would come and yell and scream but would bring him extra portions. And he said he knew that probably what, what the other soldiers envisioned was going on was something completely different than what they could have ever understood. But there was a picture in that Reader's Digest of the two of them long after the war, old men now, arm in arm, remembering that time. So what do we do with a story like this? Here were two soldiers that had been both drafted by their respective uh, countries uh, and they were uh, trained to kill one another. They, they were involved in something much bigger than either of the two of them and yet they were involved in something that united them that their countrymen did not share. And, and again, many of you have served in the military, and I should have mentioned Pastor Greg not only served in the military, but his wife Tanja also served in the military. And, uh, and so uh, you might want to tell this story differently or you may want to interpret it differently, but what I'm trying to get at is God calls some of us to serve, and that has been so since the beginning of the Christian uh, era. And, and I believe that what God uh, would have us to do as we serve our nations uh, in military service is to be careful every uh, vocation and every occupation we have has its particular uh, traps uh, for, the, for, for the spirit and for our Christian witness. Believe it or not, being a pastor has some spiritual traps. There are very, very serious uh, dangers in being a pastor. There is a spiritual kind of aggrandizement that sometimes gets a hold of pastors, and they hardly are human anymore. They're just kind of a role, walking around dispensing blessings to everybody else as their own life is in chaos, and, they're, and, and they, it's been years since they have discontinued their spiritual journey. I've met pastors all the time who have not been themselves. They're masterful pulpiteers. They can lead a church but their own journey with the Lord has stopped long time ago and they've stepped into something else and sometimes that gets very, very dark and it infects the entire uh, structure that they're in and this infects denominations and sometimes the higher up you get in these power uh, circles, the, the, the more intense the, uh, the uh, temptation becomes and you can really find yourself uh, being thought of as a really godly person that's representing a godly cause, but the interior part of your life, the reason that you're in ministry, all the things that are going on has ceased to be godly long time ago and the light has gone out. Anybody know what I'm talking about? So it's possible in any, in any field uh, to forget the gospel and forget that we are the servants of Jesus. But when we are soldiers, uh, and I, I say the we, though I have not been a soldier, the, the uh, responsibility for being a soldier responsible uh, to the, uh, the commands you're given, and yet there's limits to. As we found out, the reason that we had the Nuremberg trials after the German uh, uh, the Nazi regime was brought to an end. We had the Nuremberg trials because all of the uh, Nazis that were involved uh, in, in those atrocities claimed that they were just following orders and, and they were all tried uh, and it was a tricky thing because they were uh, not uh, uh, violating their own laws, uh, their own regime, but the Allied judges said they had violated law, the, the uh, crimes against humanity. 
And it was, that was a non-theological way of saying there is a higher law than the laws of any country, and it's the laws of God. And to the extent the laws of a country reflect the laws of God, then they're legitimate laws. And to the extent that that law does not represent the law of God, they're illegitimate laws that may be disobeyed, in fact, must be disobeyed by Christians whose higher authority is the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel. Now, where is that line? Well, we differ on that, you see. And that's where our different opinions come up about how, how are we first the disciples of Jesus and then secondarily patriots of the nations in which we reside and giving the due honor to our nation and our nation's leaders that scripture also commands us to do. Well, we have to cautiously sometimes say, gosh, that doesn't seem to me consistent with what the law of God says. But we, as the apostle Peter tells us, that no scripture is of a private interpretation. So we weigh it out together. If in fact, we're in a Christian community that's safe enough to weigh it together. And that's another thing you see, because is, do, is, our, is our Christian community mature enough to have a discussion where we say, I'm not sure I agree with this, and well, I do agree with it, and we still remain brothers and sisters together as we work out to say, what is the Spirit of God calling for me as a Christian witness in this hour and in this time? See, that's, that's what this soldier, this American soldier and this Japanese soldier were wrestling with at this time. They had to find a way to be bo uh, both Christian brothers in Christ and to realize that the world and its powers, which we still, this is, the kingdom of God hasn't fully been realized yet. And so we're caught in the tension of this and both of these soldiers had to both be obedient to their, their own nations and so forth and recognize that we're brothers in Christ. Now there's a gentleman sitting in this audience right now that could say more about this than I will ever have. He knows more about the Lord and living the, uh, for God under difficult circumstances than I would be able to put in a thimble with my finger in it. And, and, and that's Pavel Chernish back here that you've heard me speak of many times. He's sitting on my left and he is, the, he is one of the most, he is a, a hero of faith to me. He's one of the people in life I most respect and honor. Uh, and the reason was that he spent uh, some time in a prison camp uh, because he was a soldier uh, in the Soviet army and, uh, and he refused to t bear up arms against other human beings. He would serve in any way that he was asked to serve, but he did not feel that he could give loyal service to the Soviet regime because it was entirely inconsistent with the word of God. And he went to prison and he has a wonderful story he can tell you about where the Lord sent a vision to him in the middle of the night and told him to get ready the next day he was going to be released. Well, uh, he didn't know if that meant he was going to be released by going to heaven. That was entirely possible at any time. He didn't know how all this was going to happen, but it's a marvelous story about how the next day they called for him while he was out doing work detail and the other prisoners just, said, okay, your time has come. You're going to be uh, dispatched fly, frying, uh, fly, uh, firing squad or something. And they took him off, but instead he was sent back home and he met a, a, a a general along the way that had him to ride the train with him so that he would be safe all the way. So God prepared a way for him, but he never said he wouldn't serve. He didn't, uh, he didn't uh, refuse to obey orders as long as they were consistent with the word of God. We've always had that kind of tension in us. And, and so it is in that spirit that we recognize that when we are in moral and ethical conflicts of any kind, we sometimes suffer. And, and the people that suffer are to be honored because they didn't bring the suffering on themselves. They are suffering because they are doing their best to live godly and to live out the commands of God in a fallen world where bad things happen. And sometimes we're not sure where the lines are. So the Apostle Paul is uh, on his way to Asia to preach, and the Spirit of God says no, not yet, not because the Lord didn't want the gospel preached in Asia. In fact, other people were already in Asia preaching the gospel. But God had something different for Paul, a specific command, and he couldn't figure it out. 
And in the middle of the night, the Lord sent him a vision of a man from Macedonia saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, if you know your history, Macedonia is where uh, Philip of Macedon was, uh, was king. Uh, and we found his tomb not long ago. And he had a famous son. And his son's name was Alexander. Alexander. And Alexander uh, uh, conquered the entire Western, uh, Eastern world. Uh, and was just a firebrand of a young, uh, disciplined military person, and he conquered the entire Middle East that began a period that we call the Hellenization of the Middle East. In other words, that's, they were teaching them the Greek language, making colonies, and bringing the entire Middle East under subjugation. And so the Middle East would be Greek-speaking until 1453 with the fall of Constantinople. And uh, you know, then the Romans had inherited this whole structure of uh, conquest and so forth, which meant that the, that the Jews were under bondage to these people. Now, in your great-grandmother's family Bible, there's a, there's a piece between the Old and the New Testament that's called the Apocrypha, sometimes the Deuterocanonical Scriptures. Uh, and, uh, and in that are two books called the First and Second Maccabees. That's where Hanukkah comes from, by the way. And it tells the story about how the Jewish people were surrounded by the Greeks and, and, uh, were, and were commanded to do things that were uh, forbidden by the Lord and the, and the uh, worship of God. And so precisely there was a, a pig that was offered on the altar at the temple and there are all kinds of things broke loose on that. And so the Maccabees, which was a family, the Hasmonean family, they began to drive out the Greeks. But the Greeks didn't stay driven out because the Greeks had already gotten into the people's heads. And so there was this kind of cultural domination. There was this military domination. And Paul was a nationalist and a zealot. When we first find him in the book of Acts, he's trying to break off the yoke of all the Greeks and the Romans so that his country can be free and they can worship God the way that they were taught to worship God. And he's, he's willing to kill people to do this. He's willing to, to do anything that he can to get this project done because this is the will of God. But you see what God teaches us, it's not only what we do, but how we do it and the attitude we do in it, that we do it in, that makes the difference as, and, and is important. Otherwise, Jesus would have been a Pharisee. Jesus was a doctrinal Pharisee. He was entirely, he, told, he said about the Pharisees, whatever they tell you to do, do that. And he says, however they teach you, that's the way you should. So he believed what they were teaching, but he said, don't be like them for goodness sake. And so what we discover in that, it's not only to be, the, the believing the right thing or knowing the right thing to do that's important, but the condition of your heart and the way that you, uh, that you deal with other people in the discharge of your duties. That also is important. And it is a witness to the gospel in how you carry that out. You cannot take a stand for righteousness and, and, and insult people. You can't take a stand for righteousness and belittle people. You can't stand, take a stand for righteousness and put other people under your feet. That's why Paul got knocked off his horse. And so when he's knocked down off his horse, he said, what am I supposed to do? Well, there's this guy called Ananias. You're supposed to meet with him. And now years later, the apostle Paul, this zealot in trying to carry out God's will through the power of the flesh, through doing whatever he was armed with the power of the state to do this, to torture people, to do whatever he needed to do, and he was doing all this. Now the Lord says, you know what I'd like for you to do? I'd like you to go to Macedonia. You've got to be kidding. <laughs> this is like the heart of darkness. It's kind of like when the Lord called Jonah to go to Nineveh. I'll go to Nineveh if, if you'll destroy them all with a fiery blast. Can I say that? Can I say that God's going to kill all of you because you're just completely outside God's will and I want you all destroyed? Because you're not God's people. You're not a godly race. Jonah was kind of an unusual prophet in that he was a worse person than the people he was preaching to. Would not be the first time in history this has occurred. 
God gave him castor oil. You can read about that. <laughs> the tree that God gave him was castor oil plant. God gives you a castor oil plant. You've got to ask some questions about what's going on. <laughs> Go to Macedonia. Go to Macedonia. And then Paul, the obedient servant of the Lord, has already learned, I've got, I've got to do what God would have me to do. I've got to finish. I, 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 I got off script and now... I can't bring it to an end, and it's time to bring it to an end. In 1995, I was in Corregidor, one of the great fierce battles of the Second World War. I was there because it was the 50th anniversary, is that right, of the Battle of Corregidor? Yes. And I was asked to serve communion. And I looked out over all the people gathered in what had been the bloody fields of Corregidor. And we were Americans and Japanese and Filipino and Chinese, all kinds of nations, speaking different language. When we said the Lord's Prayer was a jumbled mess all out there. When we sang the hymns, it wasn't melodious from an earthly standpoint. I looked over that and like 50 years later, children, grandchildren, children of people who had died there, suffered there, we were confessing the world is coming where they'll not take up sword again. They'll beat their swords into plowshares and not learn of war again. I got to the hotel that night and I wrote a letter to a man that was in this church, John Dyson Sr., who had been in the Battle of Corregidor. And I said, John, here's what happened today. I was thinking of you. I wish you could have been there. And he wrote me back and he said, if you were there, I was there. What a beautiful thing. What a beautiful thing. I wish I could resolve the conflict for you and the paradox. We all lean a little different ways in all this. But the heart is something we all, we all agree together. And I'm going to read to you now in closing the 21st chapter of Revelation, the first few verses. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for a husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne, look, God's dwelling is with humanity. He will live with them. They will be his people. And God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more. Because the previous things have passed away. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I make all things new. And he said, right, these words are faithful and true. It is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, and I will freely give to the thirsty from the spring of water of life, and those who conquer will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son.